throw the ball, the large medicine ball, and catch it. Quickly toss it to the president, to the Supreme Court justice, over the head of a reporter, to the president's physician, to the secretary of agriculture, and back to the president again. It's certainly good exercise. It was called Bull in the Ring, and in the shade of some bushes around the White House that could block the reporters, President Hoover would exercise with his good friends in administration. The idea was to keep the ball, the big medicine ball, moving, but all the while throw it away from it. If it, the man in the middle, touched it, the next guy was it. Yeah. President Hoover could hustle. Kept him in good shape, and as Time Magazine wrote, President Hoover works up a good perspiration, takes a shower, massage, is ready for work. There's even video available, and I'll post some of that up on www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com in color, an old type of color film technology that was only recently restored. Because the film looked like black and white, and then there there, there was this small color specs. And it was just a a type of machine that's just not used anymore. But they did an approximation and, and have colorized it. That President Hoover could bring efficiency and organization to the White House, no one ever doubted, wrote Time in April 1929. He fractured presidential tradition by, heaven forbid, getting a phone on his desk instead of in the other room as other presidents had saving his cabinet members' visits to the White House, saving time. Buzzers were arranged with different sounds for different personnel that Hoover might need. If all this activity in doing it might have been what Hoover didn't do that sunk him. When he didn't go with his new scientific modern instincts, when he set aside his industrialist business friends and went with old party policy on an old issue with nary a comment. More about that. The Church of Latter-day Saints, it need not be said, was a premier influence in the state of Utah. The area populated along the Great Salt Lake by Brigham Young, and tens of thousands lived there as early as 1868 after the Civil War and right before the Transcontinental Railroad. As early as 1850, residents asked for a state. 1856, 1862, 1867, 1872. Polygamy was against federal law. Mormons in Utah insisted it was part of religious practice. It also practically helped them with population. The Supreme Court in 1879, Reynolds v. U.S., confirmed opposition to polygamy and blocked the defense of religion. Chief Justice Waits said, Religious power cannot be superior to the law of the land. In the 1880s, the Edmonds Act put the church under scrutiny and sent some of its leaders hiding. Utah remained a territory. So there was kind of a standoff that occurred. Until 1890, when church president Willard Woodruff received a revelation that polygamy was no longer favored by God and issued a statement that the practice was evil and against the church's teaching. Some 
condemned this new statement from the church, but it led to a path for statehood. And in 1896, Utah became a state. In its early years as a state, the two senators that Utah would send to the Senate had some kind of distance from the church. Thomas Kearns was a Utah Catholic. Arthur Brown was a Congregationalist. Frank Cannon was an LDS member, but not the choice of the church. George Sutherland was never baptized as a Mormon, and his family had renounced the church before his birth. Joseph Rawlins, he himself had renounced the Mormon church. So it was only when the Utah legislature named Reed Smoot in 1902. This is back when state legislators picked senators. It was the first time that an apostle of the church, a leader of the church, was to sit in the United States Senate. This caused a bit of a stir. President Theodore Roosevelt, at first, when he heard of this, said, it would be unwise to name an apostle of the church to the Senate. Utah did, and they were annoyed by his seeming interference in Utah politics. Smoot was appointed, and he arrived in the Senate. The timing was poor, as the Salt Lake Tribune story revealed that the church was still secretly approving plural marriages. The Salt Lake Tribune had a decidedly anti-Latter-day Saints slant. Nonetheless, when word got out to Washington and, and the rest of the country, there was an outrage. Not only was Smoot's religion offensive, it was suggested that he may have taken an oath of allegiance against the United States for all the past grievances that the Mormon Church had against the United States. Of course, Reed Smoot denied all these charges though he himself was the third child of a fifth wife of the mayor of Salt Lake City, Abraham Smoot. Reed Smoot opposed polygamy. He was not married to anyone else but his one wife and had taken no such oath. Smoot also made a friend, the man who previously had opposed him coming to the Senate, Theodore Roosevelt. He meets with him, according to one account. T.R. says, are you a polygamist? No, Mr. President. Good enough for me. Well, at this time, we were coming up on the 1904 election, and Mark Hanna, the senator from Ohio, was still alive, and he himself wanted to become president, who was this Theodore Roosevelt. He was just a vice president, acting as president anyway. Reed Smoot made sure that Utah would be in support of the young president. When the president supported food and drug act legislation, when that came up in 1906, Reed Smoot supported it, as he did with the Hepburn Act, controlling railroads. Railroads, Smoot said, had discriminated against the West. It was cheaper to send freight from L.A. to Boston than from Salt Lake to L.A. It was not a question of politics, Senator Smoot said but of morality, of right, and justice. Smoot would fight for these causes, but he would spend his first years in a fight for his own seat. And leaders for morality associations, from churches, from petitions, the main Presbyterian church bodies, the Methodist church bodies, constantly plagued him. A special Senate committee was established to investigate him. And he spent two years and five volumes looking into him. Political cartoons savaged him. The pressure was enough that in 1906, a Senate committee voted to suggest Senator Smoot's removal. What happens to Smoot in his early part of his Senate career from 1903 till it's decided in 1906 is very interesting um, for these times, I think, because there was a tremendous grassroots movement among particularly the Protestant churches, Democrats in Utah, who probably wanted his seat, that was stirring up quite a hornet's nest against uh, him seating. But at the same time, in Washington, 
There were many Republicans, and Roosevelt, the president, of course, being the key among them, who liked Smoot, who saw nothing wrong with having a Mormon in the Senate, and yet they were having what we might now today call trouble with their base. His new friendship with Theodore Roosevelt brought on a cartoons portraying the political trouble that supporting Smoot was burdening the president. One showing Smoot and the leader of the Latter-day Saints Church, Joseph Smith, as wasps that T.R. is swatting away from him. It went to the floor of the Senate, the vote, and it became a classic story, really, of American religious tolerance versus intolerance. One senator accused Smoot of currently cohabitating with five wives. It was a dangerous vote for Smoot. The Senate does have the power, by a two-thirds vote, to remove a member of the body, to send them home. Smoot didn't speak in the Senate in his defense. He had already issued denials to all charges given. The anti-Smoot contingents had in their champion Senator Julius Burroughs. Burroughs pleaded that Mormonism was law-breaking and law-defying as an organization and under no circumstances should be allowed a seat in any representative in Congress. Corruption was eating at the nation as long as Mormons were unchecked. Polygamy was alive and growing. It ought to stop now. This day and hour, in the national government, at no distant day will I trust lay its hand upon this unholy thing and compel its devotees to obey and law and stop filling the land with their Ill- illegitimate offspring. Such was the words of Julius Burroughs. Churches of this country, Jew or Gentile, Protestant or Catholic, guard and protect the purity of the home as the altar of their faith. Mormonism pollutes it. I protest against this effort to drag the Christian churches of the land down to the low level. T.R. is bringing senators in, he's speaking with people, and still it's not clear where it's going to go. And that's when Senator Albert Beveridge, the majority leader on the GOP side, takes the stand in the Senate chambers. Albert Beveridge was one of the nation's most dynamic public speakers. Mr. President, one thing is dearer than life. The approval of one's own conscience. A second thing is nearly as precious the good opinion of one's fellow men. Riches, power, and birth are worse than worthless without reputation. No public policy can justify the damnation of a man by his countrymen upon error. This is the fact, even though millions misinformed clamor against a man. This man is charged with treason and worse. He is charged with treason before this high court, for in cases like this, the Senate is a court, the highest court this world has ever known. And because the American people have been made to believe this infamy, they have petitioned this court for judgment against the guiltless. This fact is important. For who can say what has been the influence on the members of this court of that clamor which has assailed us? For polygamy, I have a hatred made stronger by disgust. For enemies of our government, I have a hatred. But we have seen that this accused man is not a practicer of this revolting crime, but its enemy. We have seen that he is not a traitor, but a loyal man. And so the only question that remains is that of the tolerance of his religion. And though his religion is to me incomprehensible, grotesque, and absurd, I hate intolerance of it and all religions as much as I hate treason, with which he is falsely charged before this court. 
Obedience to law, tolerance of opinion, loyalty to country. These are the principles which make the flag a sacred thing and this republic immortal. These are the principles that make all Americans brothers. By these principles, let us live and vote and die so that this government of the people for the people may not perish from the earth. There are applause on the Senate floor and throughout the galleries. The Senate then voted not to remove Reed Smoot, 43 to 27. Not only was there no question of his fitness again, the national struggle put Utah on the map of politics and to, to some extent, begin a path of normalizing the American Mormon religion. Utah became a bulwark generally of the grand old party voting for any Republican from 1900 to 2016, save Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson, holding on to Taft in 1912 with Reed Smoot's help. That's Reed Smoot's political legacy in that map of the 1912 election where you see that uh, state of Utah going for Taft and not for Roosevelt, along with Vermont. His high poke collar look, his abstinence of drinking, playing cards, smoking, maintaining a high moral image. One cartoon described him as as square, as neat as he looked. He was opposed to obscene materials. Uh, Lady Chatterley's lover drew his ire. Leading Time magazine to once have a headline, Smoot on Smut. His was a vote for prohibition. And Smoot is among those senators that pushed for that amendment. So from a struggle for legitimacy within the conservative religions of the country, definitely was transformed to somebody who was himself a bulwark of conservatism. Yet even that doesn't define Reed Smoot completely as a senator. He's not entirely a conservative there were several instances where he moved towards what might be described as progressive positions. We've mentioned his take on food manufacturers and his support for Roosevelt's Food and Drug Act bill and the railroad, his opposition to that and his desire and willingness to support regulation. He also supported the income tax, the election of senators, which... He had no problem transitioning from uh, being elected by the legislature and being elected by the people. Low-interest government subsidized loans to farmers, he was a supporter of. Presidential price fixing during World War I, he supported. Highway construction projects to boost employment. Sponsoring a national parks bill. These are among Reed Smoot's achievement as a senator from Utah. And one of his most progressive stands came when he rose to support the ban on child labor. During a Democratic administration in a bipartisan spirit, supporting a ban on child labor using the power of the federal interstate commerce regulation to enforce. He excluded uh, small family farms from that. States, Reed Smoot said, that have six-year-olds to labor in fields have been very derelict in their duty. Woodrow Wilson signed the bill that Smoot supported. It was rejected by the Supreme Court. Obviously, this fight over religious tolerance, which Reed Smoot was kind of came out of, and the individual pieces of legislation that he supported, is not where Reed Smoot is known today. It's obviously for the tariff that bears his name, Smoot Hawley Tariff, which he passed with the help of, uh, in the House of Representatives, Willis Hawley, a congressman from Oregon. Smoot, as the head of the Finance Committee in the Senate, was the larger player, and one of the reasons he will be our focus today. Woodrow Wilson said of the tariff that it had at its command a thousand disguises. Very few of us, Wilson said, taste the tariff in our sugar. It was the fight of 19th century American politics, and it extended into the 20th. With it, tax imports. Tax imports of what? Tax them how high? Whether to use the tariff funds 
merely to fund the federal government, their operations, or to use it to protect industries, American industries. It was the issue of Democrats and Republicans, with a few exceptions. Andrew Jackson would lower tariffs during his second term. Abraham Lincoln doesn't take the stump, but he makes it clear through the books that he releases of his speeches that he is a high-tariff protection man in the vein of his idol, Henry Clay. President Polk hated tariffs, said that tariffs were part of a three-pronged American system which he opposed. High tariffs, funding of infrastructure through those tariffs, and centralized banking. The American system of improvement subjugated southern and western farmers to the eastern interest Polk felt. Theodore Roosevelt, as a young, upcoming New York State legislature interested in reform, civil service reform, he makes a speech at a free trade club. And that's going to cause him a lot of problems after that. As a VP candidate in 1900, as a president, generally speaking, he retreated from that free trade position and joined the party of high tariffs. Where he ran, the Theodore Roosevelt runs into an issue with, with tariffs uh, because he's against trusts. And so he's able to pass what they call the, uh, he's, he's, he ends up in, right in time for his 1904 election, supports the Iowa idea. Where you're going to allow the president to weigh in and if another country retaliates with tariffs of their own, we can adjust. But there were still many voices in the Senate who were absolute protectionist. Protection was a hardcore idea of America. It was associated with the flag. If you look at that 1896 election where McKinley's elected, protection is going to be right up there with patriotism. It wasn't an issue where we see so much with TR that he's, he's taking the stump and he's strongly adv advocating for certain issues. Tariffs? is not one where we see him as a forceful president or forceful speaker. It's one where he's straddled. Hi, this is Bruce with a message about the premium podcast from My History Can Beat Up Your Politics.com. Remember that for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the program and also get extra episodes. Lots of them. We got something like 40 content pieces there that you'll get. And then in addition, you get back episodes of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, more depending on the level that you choose. And you also get to help out the program. Thanks to those who have already supported the premium podcast for My History Can Beat Up Your Politics at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com. We might as well have nominated a corpse. Yeah, it's not good when your own party chair is saying that about your party's vice presidential candidate. No. Democrats in 1888 nominated Alan Thurman of Ohio to run with Grover Cleveland in that year. They needed someone because Cleveland's last vice president, Thomas Hendricks, had died in office. At 74, Thurman was a... Poor replacement, perhaps. But he did his best campaigning through Michigan, West Virginia, Indiana. His speeches took on the high tariffs that the GOP party was instituting. It'd be bad for the working man, he said. It was bad for farmers, adding unnecessary costs, raising prices. And here's where Alan Thurman's stump would just fall apart. My neuralgia is so bad, it's really hurting me. Ah, oh, you'll have to excuse me, my knee really hurts. In other speeches, he would bring up his cholera and his battles with it. 
And finally, in a speech in Madison Square Garden, Thurman simply collapsed. Obviously, that became the focus of the reporters. Yet the election content turned on that issue. Cleveland was a Democrat, and that meant, in those days at least, anti-tariff. You could say free trade, but that was getting to be a term that not everybody liked. We are for the U.S. Cleveland is for Europe, the Republicans would say. The Mills bill to reduce tariff was up, and... Cleveland wanted to, in his third year, with the re-election year coming up, he wanted to support it. Edmund Morris, biographer for Theodore Roosevelt, said that Democrats wondered if the big one had lost his mind. Cleveland's advisors said, no, you're a new president, you're coming up for re-election in 1888. But Cleveland wanted a lower tariff for two reasons. As always, it was his policy. Tariffs protected some industries, but killed merchants, hurt farmers. But he also looked at disdain that the federal government had a surplus. These days, presidents would brag about having a surplus, right? No, for Grover Cleveland, that was bad. These extra millions in the federal coffers, they didn't belong. So... That would make Cleveland, I don't know what today, a conservative Democrat, pro-business, anti-business, tax-cutting globalist, pro-agriculture, anti-inflationist. Cleveland and Thurman lose that election in 1888. But Cleveland asked about this, whether he should have taken a stand and turned that election into a a free trade election. You know, they're going to say in the Republican pamphlets, it's all over for free trade Grover. Better to be defeated battling for an honest idea, Grover Cleveland felt, than to win by a cowardly trick. And his wife, Frances Cleveland, told some of the servants in the White House to please keep things ready because we'll be back in four years. And after Republicans, led by Majority Leader William McKinley, become president himself, enacted a high tariff, it increased prices on tin. And one of the mistakes they made is that Tin merchants were going door to door, and when asked why prices increased, they would blame it on Congress. So you had thousands of anti-Congress messages going out to households in America in that right at the time for that midterm of 1890, turning against tariffs. They would lose the midterms. Took Woodrow Wilson in his term to pass low-tariff legislation with the Underwood tariffs. When he's out of office, they're raised again in 1922, and there'll be more increases one that bears Reed Smoot's name. About the same time as the Cleveland tariff battle was going on and the McKinley counter battle for protection would enjoin a crop, a red crop, was growing in the American West where it was not expected to grow. A sweet root crop. The sugar beet had an advantage. They require less water at the beginning of their growing. Their tap roots are very long. And farmers in Utah had completed from the very beginning of the Salt Lake settlement, started digging canals, ditch canals, in order to irrigate fields. As settlements grew, they would find a mountain stream in the northern part of Utah and dig canals. There are thousands of miles of canals in Utah before 1870. The U.S. Department of Agriculture report in 1909 would report methods of cultivation, irrigation, drainage, and fertilization were superior in Utah to what was prevailing in the country. But growing sugar beets was still a lot of work. Seeds had to be planted 20 inches apart, or else they would just get in each other's way. Farmers had to work the field and go and thin out plants once they were sprouted and make sure that separation continued. There would be beet gangs that would go off, often young men, older children, that would 
do this kind of thinning work and then get ready for the plow to loosen the beets when it was ready. A worker would then tap the beets and clip their leaves with a knife. Wagons would take piles of beets to the end result, a bristling sugar plant. Not soon after the instruction from God, the revelation came that polygamy should be an evil not tolerated by the church. The leader of the church also informed its members that a directive of the church, that a, that a sign of patronage of the, to the church would be a contribution to the sugar industry. The Utah Sugar Company is formed in Lehigh in 1889, endorsed by the church with contributions to, to in favor of the business, considered a responsibility as one's contribution to make Utah independent. Crowds come to Lehigh, Utah to see the miracle, the first sugar that's extracted from these beets. 20,000 pounds of sugar is extracted on the first day. Eventually, by the mid-1990s, the sugar plant was paid for, helped by church contributions, state and federal beet subsidies, and enforcement and cooperation with a policy of Mormons in Utah not to buy sugar from imported sources, but to buy Utah beet sugar, even though it's slightly more expensive. Utah sugar was competing in national markets with other sugar-producing states unexpectedly. And then, in two deals worth $300 million in today's dollars, the Utah companies were consolidated with a major sugar conglomerate. One of the key churchmen slash business leaders that kept the beet sugar flowing, that organized and reorganized the way the factory and the farmers were, where the plant was working, was Reed Smoot. As a reward, he was made an apostle of the church and then later selected for senator. The tariff that Smoot proposed in early 1929 made its way through the Congress in the early months of the Hoover administration. It's not clear which way it's going to go. There are insurgents in Congress who are opposed. They're the Republicans who are opposed to high tariffs, who are opposed to the rest of the, the GOP and are siding with the Democrats to block it. At the same time, as the bill is working its way through the committee and you have a, a senator from Pennsylvania, Grundy, that is known to be in support of any protection whatsoever. And one of the things Grundy makes clear is, I won't vote to protect industries in any state from a senator that doesn't vote to protect I industries in Pennsylvania. And so there's a one-up. Okay, if you want me to vote for this bill, we got to add the tariff on this and a tariff on that. and a ta Next thing you know, the Smoot-Harley tariff raised 900 tariffs. It clears committee October 28, 1929. Horrible timing. The same day of a sell-off and a crash in the stock markets. Walter Lippmann calls the bill a wretched and mischievous product of stupidity. There is no evidence, Smoot's biographer says, that any apparent fact, any argument, any introspection even faintly disturbed him. When Smoot thought he was right, he was right. His image, righteous, has created a stone-faced historical example. He never doubted his solution that he crafted along with Hawley. The next phase of the Smoot-Harley bill, after passed, was, pres was to the president's desk. And here, something different happens. Henry Ford and the CEO of J.P. Morgan come to the White House to plead with Herbert Hoover to please reject this high tariff. You represent the new industries. You support free trade. You're a progressive business thinker. You're a modern president. 
kind of like the Koch brothers, perhaps in the form of Grundy senators, the old GOP senators. And then you have kind of like Elon Musk, really Hoover himself at this time. It's hard to think of it now, but at this time, that's, that's kind of the way he was viewed. He was associated with all the improvements in electrification and technology that coming out of the 1920s. He was the Commerce Secretary at the time that Commerce was king. And you know, Ford, the largest petition from economists to this date, started by a Yale economist, Irving Fisher, gets 1,028 economists urging Hoover not to approve this bill. There are protests from 29 countries. There are warnings that this was a Grundy bill. And Grundy was somebody who is associated with the worst kind of corruption in politics, that you give us money and we're going to vote for a tariff to protect your industry. FDR, already prepping for the presidency, was calling it the Grundy bill. Robert LaFollette, the pro- progressive senator from Wisconsin, talks about the series of deals conceived in secret for the Smoot-Harley tax. And yet, with very little comment, a quick statement comes from the White House. Most trade is free of duty, he says. It's a nice spin. But of course, exports were low because this was 1930. And some tariffs were lowered. Yes, 900 were raised and perhaps 80 were lowered. The Smoot-Hawley tariff raises the tax on cattle from 1.5 cents to 2.5, milk from 2.5 cents to 6.5 cents, butter from 8 cents to 14 cents, shoes from no tariff at all to 20%, pig iron from 75 cents to $1.12. They passed this in 1930, and... The GDP is literal of America is cut in half. Unemployment more than doubles. It's been largely blamed for the Great Depression, especially because the timing was so severe. But the Smoot Harley tariff had likely its most disastrous effect in politics. The same year as its enactment, President Hoover's party loses fifty two seats in the nineteen thirty midterm. After two retirements, and defeats in special elections, Democrats take over the House. They'd also win the next two congressional elections, increasing their majority and bringing on the New Deal. Among the casualties of the Democratic wave of the next year, 1932, were Hoover, as well as Smoot and Hawley. Now, Reed Smith would continue on as an important Latter-day Saints church leader, but something else happened in 1930. The debate over tariffs change, and a combination of industrialist GOP wanting to sell to global markets and democratic thought of low prices for consumer would keep Smoot-Hawley-type schemes out of politics for some time. To be brought up only recently, at least in a front-forward way, in the fringes of GOP politics, and only given a presidential voice by Donald Trump. There's a famous moment in the 1993 debate where Vice President Al Gore is debating with Ross Perot over NAFTA, and when Ross Perot opposes NAFTA, Gore holds up a picture, an old fading picture, of Reed Smoot and Wills Harley. And it's seen, I mean, half of it comes from the fact that these are old men in a black and white photo, but it's seen, again, indicting them for having caused the the Great Depression. So globalism has won in a set, and free trade has won, and and it's it's an odd combination. It's anti-Abraham Lincoln, quasi-anti-Theodore Roosevelt, pro-Polk, pro-Andrew Jackson, pro-Grover Cleveland, pro-Ronald Reagan, this, this odd coalition of actors throughout history were the prevailing the philosophy in terms of free trade recently. There's been a change, obviously, that we can see in attitudes towards it. We saw the TPP became like a bad word both in Republican and Democratic politics, at least on one side. NAFTA has never been quite popular. There's been a lighter smoot Harley by American. It occurs on the political left as well. Evidenced in the high union membership industries of steel and cars, 
routed in anti-Japan talk in the 1980s. Here's Mondale in 1984, Walter Mondale running against Ronald Reagan, Democrat. At the start of the next decade, I want to walk into any store in America and pick up the best product of the best quality and read Made in the USA. You know, President Obama didn't talk much about tariffs or retaliating against other countries, but the 2009 stimulus bill does contain a Buy American provision, which required that for any stimulus project funded by the, the federal government, the, all the iron, steel, and manufactured goods used in the product be produced in the United States. Not only did that fly in the face of 620 agreements the United States made, but Canadians immediately retaliated, and Canadian municipalities met and banned U.S. firms from contracts in their towns until the U.S. dropped it, which they did in 2010. The entire provision, though, from start to finish, enacted by a majority Democratic Congress, and despite a warning from the Washington Post and other voices echoing Smoot Hawley. So it occurs in more ways kind of silently. What of it? Was Smoot Hawley really that bad? And there's been a fair amount of debate since then. Current consensus is not what the common political conversation is. It's not even like what Al Gore said with, with Ross Perot. The current consensus of economists and historians looking at it, a couple major studies of it, Crusini and Kahn were two authors that looked at all kinds of different numbers. At first glance, it was an incredibly stupid action. Exports declined 50% during that period. Other countries, United Kingdom, Canada, punished the U.S. and also enacted policies favoring the British Commonwealth. Prime Minister Mackenzie King in Canada makes a political villain of Smoot in an attempt to win re-election. He doesn't, but not because he was anti-American because he wasn't anti-American enough and the other party outflanked him. You can't separate, though, that the, when, when we're looking at stats like that, it's so easy to say that what the GDP did and how it dropped, you can't separate the country was already in depression. That the stock market crash had happened before the bill was even signed by Hoover. Exports were already down 15% and were nowhere near where they are today. Low farm prices, construction recession, were already afoot. So... Perhaps Smoot and Hawley took too much blame. One economist, Crescini's analysis, says that with all the things going on, it could be as little as a 2% difference in terms of that recession in the early 1930s, a 2% reduction in, in GDP coming from Smoot Hawley. Now, that could be fleshed out. It's 2% hitting high export states more, right? It's affecting companies and investors in the stock market, so there might be a multiple effect. It's exasperating recovery when the, those, that 2% is desperately needed. Sure, sure. It's mostly true that Reed Smoot did not cause the depression the way it's commonly stated. I would be remiss, though, if I did not mention the analysis of Waninsky, who ties the progress of the bill through committee stages in 1929 with various plunges in the stock market, with a 28% drop on the day that it's passed in 1930. Companies liquidated, fired employees, cut production in advance of what they th saw as restrictive tariffs they didn't want. They were going to cut their business and global sales. Here's Ben Stein opposing that. To say that the act, which applied to a minority of imports and which raised tariffs generally six percentage points, caused the depression, is comical. Economist Dambisa Moyle author of Dead Aid, and now The Edge of Chaos, argues that globalization is not giving democracies the goods needed to make people believe in it. And she said that although the Washington Consensus, John Williamson's 1990 work that said that globalization, free market flows, free people flows, free capital flows, is the best template for success, Although for 25 years, everyone listened to it. WTO, G7, G8, G20, Davos, NAFTA. Now that's changing. It's, it's a trend that is across.
across the developed markets now um, and developing countries. Just last year, we had 644 new tariffs and quotas to bar international trade, cross-border trade. The largest imposer of those was the United States. I grew up in the globalization era, Washington consensus, more integration around trade, around cross-border capital flows, around the movement of labor, um, the sort of size of government. These are really the big tenants around the globalization agenda. So um, I think that it is absolutely the case that after sort of 20 years of that agenda, we have seen economic growth, but we've seen a deterioration of real wages. We've seen much more disaffection in terms of income inequality widening. So the notion that public policy has to respond to the, the, the mood and the zeitgeist is not surprising. Politicians, Moyo said, are paying a price for decades of expedient short-term policymaking that has run counter to the thesis of globalization. Protectionist policies favoring industries. Voters, Moyo says, are blaming globalization, but really what it is, is there could be not globalization enough. Partially implemented globalization is really what occurred. A mishmash of bilateral agreements, strict immigration trade agreements with national interests. In 2014, before Brexit, before Trump, the DHL Connectedness Index measuring 140 countries, making up 95% of world GDP, said globalization was going in reverse. Capital flows, sure, were flowing. Capital was flowing all across these countries. And immigration was being restricted, and so were products. American Europe subsidize their agriculture, and that not only affects U.S. markets, but also props up those players when they export into the world market, and is not an example of pure competition with smaller farmers in other countries. As of 2016, before Trump's election, the U.S. raised tariffs on imports of cold roll steel to 522%, had been 266%. Paper clicks. 130% tariff. Peanuts, 163%. Tobacco, 350%. There's a little difference between these pre-Trump bipartisan consensus tariffs and smoot in thinking. Maybe in scope, but not in thinking. But the main fear is inflation. Rising trade tariffs alone increase prices of imports. Closed movement of labor would force wages up. Governments will favor national champions, big companies, and industries when they protect, as they did in the 19th century. We lost that connection between tariffs and trusts, and tariffs and big corporations, tariffs and the rich getting richer and things like that. We've lost that a bit in our mind. But as in anything with history, if you change history, you could bring back evils of the past. And... It's kind of a bipartisan idea that government shouldn't be protecting and favoring players within a country. With protection comes that kind of too-big-to-fail analysis. But if you do bring something back, it's worthwhile to look at the history and see what the negative side of that was then. And I think President Cleveland explains it as well as anyone. But our present tariff laws, the vicious, inequitable, and illogical source of unnecessary taxation ought to be at once revised and amended. These laws, as their primary and plain effect, raise the price to consumers of all articles imported and subject to duty by precisely the sum paid for such duties. Many of these things, however, are raised or manufactured in our own country, and the duties now levied upon foreign goods and products are called protection to these home manufacturers because they render it possible for those of our people who are manufacturers to make these taxed articles and sell them for a price equal to that demanded for the imported goods that have paid custom duty. So it happens that while comparatively a few use imported articles, millions of our people who never used and never saw any of the foreign products purchase and use things of the same kind made in this country and pay therefore nearly or quite the same enhanced price. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Uh, remember to go there. I'm going to have a link to that video showing Herbert Hoover 
playing ball in the White House. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, it's a lot more fit than I thought he was, you know, uh, that we commonly see from the, we think from the photos. Remember about the premium podcast. It's available at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com. Thanks for listening.